Foundation Board of Directors to our first Hourglass Forum of 2008. Thank you for coming and I look forward to uh, a really a thought-provoking evening with our distinguished speakers. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. We can't do events like this without them. Uh, the Floyd Institute for Public Policy and Analysis at Franklin and Marshall, thank you. Uh, the Bank of Lancaster County, I think that Greg Lefevre, CEO, is, uh, is here tonight. And I thank them. Thank you, Greg. And Worley and Obetz, the uh, largest local transportation fuels and uh, home heating and comfort company. Uh, thank you, where your management team. Thanks an awful lot. I really appreciate your continuing support. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, our moderator tonight needs uh, very little local introduction. Uh, a longtime leader in state and regional planning and transportation, uh, senior fellow of the uh, Floyd Institute and an Hourglass board, uh, board member, uh, would we please welcome Mr. Ronald Bailey. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. Um, on behalf of the Hourglass Foundation and also uh, the Floyd Institute for Public Policy of Franklin and Marshall, I want to also welcome you all to this uh, forum tonight. I think it's going to be a very interesting forum. And I think we should especially recognize Franklin and Marshall for their graciousness of providing this facility for our use tonight. This is, in fact, the first time uh, that this particular room has been used for other than classroom purposes. So you're all very honored guests and uh, we uh, deeply appreciate the support of the college. Um, we'll also preface my remarks by saying that what you will learn tonight uh, will have application uh, in the very near future. If you came in uh, the back there, you might have seen some papers on a table. If you did not pick them up, I suggest that you do pick them up. Um, they are flyers talking about a transportation summit that uh, the county is going to be having on February 19th. It's going to be at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg. And we're in fact going to be bringing uh, Secretary Beeler back to speak that night. He will be uh, speaking on the uh, night of the 19th. And the next day, uh, they're going to have Barry Seymour, who is the Executive Director of the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Council, talking about some of the very in, uh, innovative things that that agency is doing uh, in the Philadelphia metropolitan region. And in my uh, present capacity over in Chester County, I work with Barry a lot. I serve on his board of directors. And I can tell you uh, that some of these approaches to transportation are among the, the finest in the nation. The reason for this forum is fairly fundamental, and that is that the way we have done business in Lancaster County for years and years and decades may have to change, may have to change very dramatically. Because the way we've done business is that we allow land to be developed and uh, maybe we make some improvements on site, maybe we fix a, a signal down the road or maybe we install a signal which actually limits the capacity of the road passing the development. And uh, then we kind of expect somebody else to come with wheelbarrows of money and to fix the problem. And we have more and more and more development in the county and the roads get more and more congested and we all get more and more frustrated because it doesn't seem like anybody's coming with wheelbarrows of money to fix the problem. Well, it's an unreasonable expectation. Uh, in a very real sense, there isn't the money to do this. Um, but there's all kinds of games. And one of the games that we, in fact, now hear are developers will come up and, and uh, say, well, my project's going to impact the highways. We'll talk to the congressman, and we will get earmarks. And we hear this all the time. Well, an earmark is nothing more than a provision put in an appropriation or an authorization bill that says that the money, a certain amount of money, can only be spent on a specific project. It doesn't mean there's any more money. It just means that that money can only be spent on that project, and frequently it's not near enough money. Let me give you a very practical or pragmatic example just to the south of us. In the state of Maryland, there is a, a major development occurring where the federal government is changing the mission of the Aberdeen Proving Ground, and they are making it the research and development center for the Department of Defense. That means that within the next couple of years, they're going to be moving to that facility somewhere on the order of 19,500 federal positions and civilian contractor positions. 
plus those 19,500 uh, workers are going to be bringing their families. And the impacts are going to be tremendous. There was a uh, symposium on these issues um, just uh, a week ago. And the, the United States, one of the two United States senators from Maryland announced at that seminar uh, that she had obtained a $15. million earmark in federal funds for BRAC-related transportation improvements. Uh, and she was very proud of this. Uh, Secretary Beeler's uh, uh, counterpart in Maryland was also on the program. He wasn't quite so sanguine, and he said um, that in his address, that he was concerned about high-end projects or road repairs and reconstructions that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and sometimes take as long as a decade to complete. Adding a lane to a major highway, such as Interstate 95, would be an example of a high-end project that may be necessary, in fact, to accommodate this development at Aberdeen. The uh, Transportation Secretary from Maryland said, these jobs are arriving in 2009. That's tomorrow morning in transportation planning. It's a serious problem. You know, if the development in Aberdeen occurs, how many years are we going to see tremendous traffic congestion before it can get fixed, before there's money available to do it, before all the engineering and, and work can be done? And it's a problem in Pennsylvania. It's a problem nationwide. And in putting together this forum, I thought, really, the person who can best explain the situation that we are in is the Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And Alan Beeler is a graduate of the um, uh, University of Pittsburgh. He also holds the equivalent of a master's degree in transportation engineering from Yale University. I have to get Art Mann and Secretary Beeler apart tonight. You know, Harvard and Yale, can we say? Um, but uh, in addition to that, he has a long and distinguished career in Pennsylvania. Uh, much of his career was spent with the Port Authority in, uh, in Pittsburgh. And uh, then he went into the private sector, did consulting for a number of years, and was appointed by Governor Rendell to be the Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth. And that's one of the finest appointments that the governor has made. I personally had the pleasure of working with Secretary Beeler both on transportation issues and also on the State Planning Board, which he's one of the six cabinet secretaries on the, on the board. And so I'm very pleased to introduce to you tonight Secretary Alan Beeler, uh, Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Alan. Ron, thank you very much, and it's, it's a really pleasure to to join you, Representative, and, and other members. I don't know if other members of the legislature are here, but we, we may end up getting uh, some good questions, hopefully. Um, it's, it's, I was asked to kind of just sort of set the stage. As Ron mentioned, there's uh, apparently going to be a summit on transportation in a, in a few weeks here. And I was asked to kind of set the stage and talk a little bit about where we are funding-wise with the Commonwealth. I'll try to do that and um, kind of tell you a little bit of history of what at least sort of my brief glimpse of Pennsylvania, which has started uh, five years ago. So I've got that sort of uh, perspective uh, working with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and, and trying to hopefully do the best we can in terms of investing the public's money uh, in our transportation system. But also, it's, it's really important to understand not only the, what's going on in the Commonwealth, but perhaps a little bit of connection with the, with the national uh, status, if you will, because there's some interesting sort of uh, problems coming up here right on the horizon on the national side, in addition to the difficulties we've had on the, on the state side. So with that, let me see if I can give you a quick little glimpse of things and uh, talk a little bit at first about Pennsylvania. Um, as I think of Pennsylvania, first of all, let me just give you two seconds worth of, uh, uh, you know, what's going on in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, in terms of the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, <clears throat> has a sort of an unusual road ownership status, if you will. We, we have, uh, we own 40,000, or we're responsible for, for owning and maintaining and upkeep of 40,000 miles of roads in the state. There's about another 76,000 or so <clears throat> that are owned by local municipalities and counties and so on. Um, about 75% of the traffic volume is on the 40,000 mile side as opposed to the municipal roads. Um, PennDOT also owns 
we, we measure bridges as anything that's eight feet or longer um, when, when we keep track of things. But uh, in Pennsylvania, the PennDOT uh, owns 25,000 bridges that we're responsible for. Um, if you're looking at the, how does PennDOT sit with other states in the United States, we are about the fifth largest road owner. We're, uh, you know, about the third largest uh, bridge owner. And the, 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 bridge, the bridges on the national level are categorized in anything. It's 20 feet or over, just to give you a sense. But more importantly, it's a, it just shows that we're a, we're a large owner of, of facilities uh, that have a pretty significant responsibility to, to maintain. Uh, okay. I am now stuck in uh, every... Oop. I'll back up one here. Can you help me back up one frame? Back up. Back up. Let's back up. Okay, we're in electronic craziness here. All right, do it again. All right? To, it's, okay, maybe it's, I don't know, it's because it's loading, that's what's going on, because it's a, it's a big file, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, let me just give you a quick glimpse of other modes in Pennsylvania. In the case of public transportation, there are 73 different providers of public transportation in Pennsylvania. <coughs> Clearly uh, overwhelmed, if you will, by the enormity of the Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia systems, but what's interesting in Pennsylvania is there's a tremendous amount of small urban and even rural systems that are important to Pennsylvanians throughout, throughout our area. We carry about 400 million riders a year on the combination, if you will, of the systems. In addition, there are, in fact, inner city rail systems operated by Amtrak, and you can see they kind of touch different parts of the, of the state, and we all know about the sort of the Harrisburg to Philadelphia Keystone service, but there's obviously service that runs from the Philadelphia region all the way through across the, the state to, to Pittsburgh and on towards Chicago, although it's a pretty small amount of service once you get w uh, west of Harrisburg. The, uh, the amount of frequency of this trip is almost non-existent. There's another still a line that goes from Washington through the Cumberland Valley area up to Pittsburgh, and we have a little, we have a piece of the so-called Northeast Corridor that runs from Delaware or from Washington up through Delaware up to uh, through Pennsylvania to New Jersey and New York and to Boston and so on. And we have a little tiny little piece up in the very northwest part of the, of the state with a, a line that comes from New York City through Rochester, Buffalo and on down through Erie and eventually Chicago. Um, so we have some smattering of inner city service, but <clears throat> unless you're talking about the part that runs through Philadelphia toward New York or the Pittsburgh, or I'm sorry, the Harrisburg to Philadelphia piece, the service is pretty, pretty sparse. We have a surprising amount of freight rail service in Pennsylvania. There's over 5,000 miles of freight rail lines in Pennsylvania. Obviously, we're an old northeast uh, state, so we developed in the, in the era when uh, rail was king. We have now about 5,000 roughly, not quite, but roughly half is sort of the big carriers, the so-called class one carriers like CSX and Norfolk Southern and Canadian Pacific and so on. And the other half are the smaller short lines, but very important to our, to our economy, as, as many of the short lines are the lifeline of the access to local, local uh, businesses. In addition, to kind of complete the, uh, the transportation pits, uh, picture in, in uh, Pennsylvania, there are 15 commercial service airports, some which are probably hanging on by a thread, um, that have very few commercial flights, but a few that are probably heavily subsidized. But we have 15 commercial carrier uh, service airports uh, in Pennsylvania, and we have a, a little over, a, you know, some over 100 general aviation airports that are, are uh, typically uh, private aircraft, just to give, a, again, a sense of it. Let me turn quickly to focus a little bit heavier into the, the highway and bridge part of our business. Um, because in the case of the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, <clears throat> out of a 
five or six billion dollar budget, probably four of those billions go into the, the highway bridge system that we own and operate. The rest is typically grants in, in public transportation, and some aviation grants and, and rail grants. But let me just key in a little bit on the highway side, highway and bridge side. Over the last five years, this has been the amount of construction lettings that we have we have had, and this is kind of our record, if you will, as we've gotten projects ready for letting. Um, quite a steep slope in the last few years, um, and that's due to a couple things. There was an increase because of, of our own tax structure. There is something called, and I won't go into a great detail, but there's something called an oil company franchise tax. Part of the gas tax that we all pay at the pump is dependent on wholesale price. It's in the 04 and 05 period, uh, it went through the entire range that was allowed by law and added some additional dollars. That helped to increase that slope that you see and allowed the department to make some additional improvements. Um, in the most recent period, uh, most of the increase has been related to inflation, unfortunately. So we're not getting a lot more from our for our dollar, but there's inflation costs have really been challenging us no question about it, to the tune of 30 some, 35 percent inflation in a couple of year period, a number we've never seen before in our history, never ever, that kind of level of, of increase. So it's really been a shock to us uh, who've seen some of those numbers. Some of those contracts have let us finish a series of some of the big projects that may have been started years and years ago. Ron talked about the kind of lead time that it takes to deliver big projects. It is. It is frustrating and awful, and we wish we could change it. And, we, and every administration I've ever dealt with, whether it's the group that I'm dealing with right now or previous administrations who I have great respect for, have fought like the Dickens to try to reduce the time frame. But it is, it is a, very, a very tedious process to build big projects because of the environmental impacts and the various reviews involved. Nevertheless, uh, that's been our process. And here is interesting, just to kind of a just piece of education, over the last 20 years or so, you can see the kind of growth in traffic volumes that we've had. And this is the average throughout the state. So you can see that in terms of, uh, um, of our passenger vehicles, 35% growth in 20 some years. But look at the trucks, 83% increase in truck traffic. And again, you folks are not probably surprised by that if you, if you've been traveling through the roads in this area, in a mid-state Pennsylvania, we've seen probably more than our so-called fair share, if you will, simply because we're sort of in a nexus of the location of you know, getting all of the, the, port in, the port traffic that comes in through Port of New York and New Jersey and Wilmington and Philadelphia and so on. We're just sort of at a crossroads. But, it's, but it really is significant in what it means in terms of the, the cost of, uh, or the, the challenges that we all face in trying to deal with it. PennDOT has spent a lot of energy over in recent years trying to keep the surface condition of its road in reasonable shape. And in some cases, we're making a little progress. In other cases, um, it's been difficult. We have something called the International Roughness Index, and that's what so-called IRI is. So uh, us engineer guys and you know, can't stop ourselves from talking in acronyms, but there you go. Um, but this is, at the when we measure roughness, it's like golf scores. The lower the number, the better they are. So this scale, if you look closely on this scale on the graph on the left, you'll see that the, the smaller numbers are at the top of the graph. And so if you can get a slope that goes up at the end, that's a good thing. In the case of our interstate system in Pennsylvania, the red line tells our progress over the last few years in making it, our, our interstates have gotten smoother uh, based on our measurements. We measure the interstates once every year, incidentally, so we, uh, we have a pretty good, we have a pretty good uh, indicator of our progress. And you can see in blue the national average. We're actually better than the national average on our so-called interstates. There's also a part of the system in, in the highway world called the so-called national highway system. Um, the interstates are automatically on it, but there are other roads like Route 283 and Route 15 and Route 30 that are also on the national highway system that are not interstates. And you can see how we've done on those roads. 
and it's been relatively flat, a little bit better toward the end on the right-hand graph, but about flat. We also measure two other categories of roads that PennDOT owns. Because PennDOT owns so many roads and so many secondaries, we also measure roads that are so-called non-highway, uh, national highway system roads. And on the ones that the graph on the left are, are roads that carry less than 2,000, or more than 2,000 vehicles a day. And the graph on the right shows the ones that are the smaller carrier roads, more rural roads that PennDOT owns that are under 2,000. And in, in, in the, the graph on the left, you can see it's been a roughly flat. On the one on the right, we've made some progress. But uh, in fact, those, those, those numbers or those, those graphs, which show we've gotten better, don't, doesn't tell a story because we're still behind on a number of our, especially on our rural roads. Switching to another very sore topic in Pennsylvania is the condition of the state-owned bridges. And unfortunately, I wish it was only the state-owned bridges, but there are many, many county and locally owned bridges that are in this kind of shape as well, if not worse. We're not proud of it, but it's in fact a problem that's been worked on by the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation for now almost three decades, and we're probably almost treading water. Um, it's, we've got an unusual number of bridges in Pennsylvania, and unfortunately, um, these bridges are, uh, uh, are very old. And as a result of that, um, we, have, we have been swimming upstream, and as I say, it's been going on for, for a very long time. In the case of the, of the bridge situation, uh, I know that there was a particular act back in, believe it or not, in 1982, and it was called the Billion Dollar Bridge Bill. And uh, the Billion Dollar Bridge Bill set up a category of funds specifically earmarked for, for bridges because folks were really going really gonna to push hard on the bridge system. And I can tell you that the people who came before me worked hard at that and handed off the problem for, for the folks who are the more recent ones, such as myself, and I wish we could have been able to, uh, to be able to solve the problem, but it is huge. And it is, it is just these kind of problems that, that tell you where we are in our, in our history in Pennsylvania. We have, a, we have huge un, unmet needs. Um, we're fighting inflation, and clearly we've got uh, some financial resource constraints that we've got to come to grips as we, as we move forward. In March of 2004, as uh, a number of folks within my group were struggling to undertake what happens every two years at PennDOT, and in not only at PennDOT, but throughout Pennsylvania, we go through a cycle where we update something called a four-year transportation improvement program. And what's on this program is any project that is to receive state and federal funds, any, any transportation project, and what we do every two years is, is we update the program and we drop off what's been finished and we add two more years and go on. And it's part of a comprehensive planning process and it's a programming process and it's gotta be fiscally restrained and on and on and on. And, and as we were getting ready to, to update the program in 04, I sat with my folks and I was still now a year into my tenure at PennDOT and a whole lot of good folks from the planning gang including one of the guys who is now retired from the planning grading, sitting in over there. And you can raise your hand. Go ahead. Come on. He's going to expose himself. But there's a lot of good folks who came to us and said, well, let's get real about this program. We'll talk about what our situation is. And it was very clear that the department, <clears throat> because of working with communities who talked to their legislators, who said, we really need X project that's really going to be important to us, and so various projects got on to the program. And I was asking the question, because some of these projects had really big costs. I said, well, can you just tell me a little bit about these projects? Because they were projects that were on these program for little, for pieces of work. And when I say pieces of work, part of it was for the, for the initial engineering, part of it was for the environmental work, part of it was for right away, and part of it was utilities. And somewhere there was construction to be scheduled on these projects. And the projects I was looking at on the, on the program were on there for engineering work. And I said, oh, well, when are they going to be going to construction? Well, our latest guess is, is it's probably the year 2019. I said, you're kidding. 
I said, come on, 2019, right? I'm going to be dead. <laughs> so seriously, when are you, come on, when are you going to really be going to construction? No, 2019. So 2019. Okay, then tell me what the, our financial situation is going to be in 2019. Well, we're not sure. I said, have you accounted for inflation? Did you know that when you're working on big projects that require environmental clearance, your environmental impact statement is now too old after a certain period of time and you've got to start over again? I said, what are we doing? Because it got real scary. And there was, in fact, 26 projects on our, on our program that had a total price tag at that point in 04 of five billion dollars, five billion dollars, was the cost if we could build them that day. Five billion dollars, and these things were stretched out to 2018 or 2019. So I said, "Okay, <clears throat> let's 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 do real, let's do straight talk. What should we be doing?" And we estimated that we would be spending somewhere between five and eight hundred million dollars of the five billion in engineering work that probably would get stale that would be wasted money. I said, we can't do that. And frankly, because the planning folks at the department are, are pretty realistic, and they said, well, we've been kind of nursing these things along. And there's an awful lot of people who've been working hard, but, but no, you're right, it's probably we shouldn't do those things. So I said, all right, let's not do them then. I said, let's, but let's, what can we do? And we broke these things into one or two categories. Either we should put our pencil down, stop, defer the work, and not just not do any more at all. Or maybe if we could take some of those projects and reconstitute them, skinny them down. I said it's fair game that if we could also modify these things and have a smaller appetite to where we could really deliver it, then that was okay. So it turned out that, that somebody said, geez, you better call some legislators. Oh, that, you know, you got to understand, I'm only there a year, I don't know all the ways of the world at the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and the importance of dealing with 253 legislators. So I said, oh, okay, yeah, good, let's, well, who do we call? Well, get the map out, let's find these 23, 26 projects. I'll be darned if 26 projects didn't, in fact, touch the districts of 73 legislators. I said, I, oh my gosh, all right, get on the phone. So off we go. We, uh, a gentleman who was then the Deputy Secretary of Planning and I took on the responsibility of making 73 phone calls. And I have to tell you, it was an interesting experience. It was an interesting experience because out of the 73 phone calls we made, I think three, maybe only three of those phone calls were painful, where people said, no way are you going to change this project that I've been working on. I was dumbfounded, and I can't tell you how pleased that the other 70 went pretty well. And because to show you how young guys who, it's like, you know, you're too dumb to know what kind of problem you're facing. That was the deal. <clears throat> on the list was the chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee. On the list was the Senate pro tem. On the list was the Senate minority leader. And so it goes, you know. So we just stepped on everybody's toes. It was a wonderful day. But it was, as I say, it was really interesting that most of the folks said, we understand that we don't, you know, this is not going to be the most joyous news to my constituents, but I appreciate the fact that, you're number one, you're calling me, and number two, you're telling me straight stuff. And if, if it was otherwise going to mean that we were going to frankly kid ourselves and potentially spend five to $800 million wastefully, we're with you. I could have knocked me over with a pin, but that was the case. And, uh, and that told me something that at least we can have a discussion with folks in the legislature. Um, that was a precursor to a much broader piece of work that over the next couple of years it became clear that we were pretty far behind the eight ball. The governor in um, February of, 19, of 2005 said that he wanted to put together a group of folks that was bipartisan to take a real hard and honest look at transportation funding in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, and uh, 
I uh, drew the short straw. He said, Beeler, you're going to be the chairman of this group. I said, oh, wonderful. Who's on the committee? He said, I'm not sure yet, but we're going to have the members of the, the House and the Senate suggest names. And the bottom line is this is the group of people who ended up on this little nine-member group, and our challenge, our charge by the governor was take a hard look at uh, the highway, bridge, and public transportation systems in Pennsylvania and come back to me in a year or whatever it takes with a recommendation, tell me how, how, you know, what our situation is and tell me if there's a problem, what you recommend in terms of solving it. This group of nine people ended up, and I have to tell you, there is a, you know, without going into the personalities of all the people on this picture, some of you may have seen, some are not, some are legislators, some are just uh, uh, business folks or labor leaders. We had such a wide cross-section of the, 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 the most the strongest private business people to the strongest labor folks and everything in between, I had no clue how it was really going to turn out. But I'll tell you, this, peop this group of people, I, I can't tell you how proud I, uh, I, I was of them, um, that they really worked hard together. And they'd set up five principles to guide their work. And I'll just tell you those real quickly. And here they are. One is that whatever we ought to do, we ought to make sure that if it requires additional funding sources, that they ought to have those characteristics. They ought to be reliable, dedicated, inflation, and so on. Also, that we ought to make sure, if because we're, 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 what we're doing is we're toying with the public's money here, and we better darn well end up having a, a commensurate series of recommendations about performance and make sure that, that what we're recommending is responsive uh, performance-wise uh, in addition to understanding and addressing uh, needs. Also, we ought to be thinking about integrating transportation and land use along with being kind to the environment and considering economic development. We also ought to be pretty judicious about making investments in new facilities and that we ought to make sure that we're spending a lot of energy on repairing what we've got first before we venture off and consider expansion. And I have a feeling in the next few weeks at the summit, there's going to be a lot of discussion about those topics. This is part of what we uh, unfortunately uncovered, that the average age of our bridges in Pennsylvania is 50 years old, and over 60% are, are 40 years old and sort of in the wings of becoming ones that are so old and beyond their design life. In fact, if you really look at where we've been over recent years, I've got a couple of graphs that will be a little strange, but the one in blue tells you by the number of bridges, 23% of our bridges are structurally deficient in Pennsylvania on the state system. We also, PennDOT engineer folks, also look at it by the square footage of deck area on the bridge, and it's not that different. It's about 21%. Um, and as you can see, over the years, it's, it's, it's varied a little bit, but not much. The, the funding commission identified the following, that we had something like almost 6,000 structurally deficient bridges, we had 8,500 of our 40,000 miles of roads were in poor condition, and we had a transit system that was facing some real crisis issues last year. The commission also identified roughly the, the kind of what it recommended as the, the needs that had to be dealt with, and that amounted to $1.7 billion. $1.7 billion in new money every year, not just one time. So it is a big, big figure. The commission recommended a series of, of ways to raise the money. Uh, the first one is, uh, you think of it as the so-called oil company franchise tax. It's really gas tax. The next one is some license registration fees. It also recommended certain things happen on the transit side, all painful, including really transfer and so on. And that would make up the billion seven. Uh, we, th we completed the report, handed it off to the members of the General Assembly as well as the governor. The governor said, thanks, Beeler. Nice try. He said, he said, what he really said was, I've looked hard. He said, I think the work that you folks have done to define the level of need is right. He said, but in, I've got to think hard about whether to recommend the specific mechanisms that you folks have suggested. And uh, I'll just tell you, we spent a lot of time in the next two, couple of months. The, the report was finished in November of 2006, and uh, between uh, Thanksgiving and New Year's of uh, that, that period of time, 
spent a lot of time working with the governor, and he ended up saying, he, be, he said, I would like to advocate leasing the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And you know, uh, as you know where we are today, that didn't happen. But he recommended that as a, as a technique. He thought it could possibly generate 900 and some odd million dollars a year. He also recommended a different twist on funding for transit, which was a, a tax on oil companies' gross profits. He then uh, eventually went and uh, met and proposed that to the, to the legislature. And without going into great detail, the legislature did not concur with that. The governor did say, if you don't concur, you have a different idea, I'm willing to talk. And without going through all the machinations, the bottom line is that the legislature approved this mechanism last summer. They, put, they approved increasing uh, through working with the turnpike, increasing turnpike tolls over time. They also approved authorizing tolling of Interstate 80 using various bond financing techniques that would produce, on average, over the next 10 years, around $950 million. And that was what was known as Act 44. Um, Sorry, I uh, went backwards. Um, so the, the big money generators, if you will, with the Act 44 were Interstate 80, which is shown in red, and, the, and what's shown in green, which are the elements of the turnpike. So that's what was approved by the, the legislature, and that's the rule of the, or that's the law of the land as we sit today. And some of the initial payments have been provided. If you look on the transit side of Act 44, um, this is what is projected with Act 44 over the next 10 years, is what's in the yellow graph. Starts out around the first year in 2007-8, 300 million dollars. It'll then grow uh, uh, throughout the period of the 10 years. And you can see what the blue line is. If the, the highway side starts out at 450 million dollars for a total of the initial period is 750 million dollars, and it'll grow to an average of 950 by the time the period is done. And that's where we are today. Where that ends, it's not clear. Because one of the elements is lease or, or uh, tolling Interstate 80. And you have to ask the federal government for permission to do that. The, the Turnpike folks have filed a so-called application. We don't know what, the, what, what will happen. If it, if it does, if it is approved, we'll have that kind of a, an outcome. That will be the revenue that we see over the next 10 years. If it's not approved, there's a, there's a provision in Act 44 where the, the, uh, the revenue will drop to uh, a steady state of $250 million a year for highways and $200 million for transit. It'll produce some pretty significant problems. Whether, whether the, uh, the graph ends up looking like this or this, it's considerably under what the recommendation of the Funding Commission is, as you can probably see. So we still are, are in trouble. One of the other things that I just mentioned very quickly that came out of the commission and that the department had been working on, and I'll simply point to our next speaker who was, who was part of a consultant group who worked with us on these kind of things, was to undertake what we call smart transportation. And that is recognizing that money in fact counts and that we ought to be choosing projects that really have a high value to price ratio and ought to be looking beyond the normal sort of level services kind of things <clears throat> perhaps concentrate on safety as opposed to only capacity improvements and also look at things that would accommodate various modes and begin to think about what the land use impacts of our investments are and perhaps how the land use can help us as we think through the future as to what those investments are. So we're, we hardcore sort of similar engineering types are trying to understand better what the land use implications are of our investments and vice versa, how land use, perhaps working closer with communities about land use design, might in fact have an impact on the growth of development and growth of traffic on our road system, as well as obviously things like spinning off development or spinning off some of the, some of the demands onto either transit or rail systems and so on. So we will see. We are we, at least I consider us neophytes in this area at this moment, and we are trying to catch up and work hard to understand this. Let me quickly give you a little snapshot on the national system and then, uh, and then uh, uh, conclude. There's uh, a week and a half ago or two weeks ago, there was a 
report that was finally produced by another study commission, if you will, similar to our statewide commission. This was a national commission called the National Surface Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission. They finished their report, and what did they have to say? What they had to say was that um, there's a bleak picture in terms of the current, there's something called a highway trust fund on the national level, out of which comes money for public transportation as well as highways. So I thought I'd show you the parallel on the national level. If you look right in the, sort of the upper two-thirds of this graph, there's a line, there's a horizontal line that says 0, 0.0. The current balance of money in the highway trust fund is in two categories. The highway side is in green, and the transit side is in red. If the balance of money in the highway trust fund for, the, for highway projects crosses the zero line, we're in trouble. The highway trust fund is, is going to go bankrupt in 2009. Last thing I knew, 2009 in fiscal year starts in October of this year. So we are facing a looming crisis in the highway trust fund. So not surprising, we know about challenges on the state level, and we see some challenges coming on the national level as well. Looks like transit's going to be a little later, in five or six years later, but it's still facing a downward spiral and says it's, it's simply a warning sign that we need to deal with. This commission of, I don't know, 12, or 12 people, I guess, um, recommended that as they looked currently, when you think about how much money the federal government puts into transportation, when you think about how much the states put into transportation and local municipalities, currently it's around $86 billion annually a year. They think the right number is around 225. So just give you a sense of what they think about infrastructure improvements, about expansions, and so on. They recommended there's something called Safety Lou, and that was the name given to the last federal transportation reauthorization bill um, that will uh, typically, in the last three lifts, the transportation bill has been a, a bill that lasts for six years. The current Safety Lou period takes us through 2009, so pretty soon. What they have recommended because really the job of this commission was to think as to what the people ought to be thinking about for the next reauthorization. What they said is basically they recommended scrapping the program. They recommended starting anew with a different approach. And they recommended 10 federal areas. And I'll just mention them quickly without going into great detail. They said we've got to rebuild America, meaning that the inf infrastructure that we've got, some of it is so old like we know about in Pennsylvania that it's got to be fixed first, and we ought to do that. Just like a leaky roof on your house, shame on you if you're not fixing your leaky roof before you add an addition to the house. We ought to be competitive globally. So we ought to do those things. If that means having a different way to handle goods and freight, and we ought to think about how our ports operate and how our rail system transports goods as opposed to handling it mostly by highway, we ought to do that. We ought to think about the congestion and difficulties we have in, in, in especially in metropolitan areas, a particular focus. We ought to think about connecting America with inner city passenger rail service where it makes sense. You can't have inner city rail service everywhere. It would be silly. You wouldn't, couldn't afford it. But you ought to think about it because we better think about connecting America, small towns, as well as inner city passenger rail, as we try to think and encourage people to change their travel habits. Yes, we've got to still look at highway safety. We've got to also be better stewards environmentally than we are. We've got to deal with global warming and reduction in carbon emissions. It's for real. And what goes along with that is also a different picture from an energy standpoint. We are the, one of the larger consumers of petroleum per capita in the world, not to say we're the highest, but it's, we, are, we are pretty far behind the eight ball. We ought to, as we think about federal, special federal lands, we think about national parks, we ought to think about instead of having everybody arrive by auto, we ought to have some kind of internal transit shuttle systems to protect those lands in addition to serving people. And finally, we ought to have a thoughtful research and development program that's going to lead us in a different direction. So that's what our friends at the federal side uh, talked about. Governor Rendell is thinking about the next reauthorization as well. It turns out that um, he is going to be the president of the National Governors Association next year. 
It's just that uh, he's been active in that group and uh, was elected to be vice president, which he is this year, and he's going to be president next year. He has said one of the things he, he really thinks is critical is infrastructure repair, and he said to do that, I better darn well have a bipartisan platform of support, and I would like to get started on that quest. He doesn't become the president until this summer, but he said, I got to start having some discussions. This picture of, of uh, Governor Rendell, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Mayor Bloomberg was taken a week ago. He was in Los Angeles with those two gentlemen who represent a sort of an independent uh, side of the House as well as a Republican side of the House saying, let's try to at least start this discussion nationally. And so that's what he was doing, and he hit three themes. One was infrastructure repair, economic competitiveness, and environmental sustainability. Boy, a lot of these things sound like, ironically, exactly what the national group came out with almost at the same time. Um, so it's clear that we're all thinking those things. I'll, I'll, I'll close with two slides. That we are facing, you know, some tough, tough times ahead. And I think the, the watchword here is um, these things, uh, you know, in my brief time working at the department, which has been absolutely my pleasure, we got some men and women who are incredibly dedicated, and I couldn't be more proud to work with them, and also the planning folks throughout Pennsylvania, and whether that's at the local county level like Lancaster or whether it's a, at the metropolitan planning level, it's been a joy. And we are all facing these things and frankly, folks like yourselves who think about these things need to help us think jointly because we've got to come face to face with these issues and decide whether we want to move forward or not. And I think these couple of these two things are some of the ingredients of us t thinking through because it's not just money. We can throw all the money in the world at this problem, and I don't think we can give up with it, because I don't think we, the folks will vote for it. But I think, yes, we probably need some more money, but we better start looking at longstanding practices, and Ron kind of alluded to that, and even his open remarks. And land use, certainly configuration, are some areas that we need to think about. With that, thank you very much, and I guess uh, we're going to have another presenter, and then I think we're going to be involved in Q&A. Thank you very much. Okay, I have no idea how to shut this down. So. All right, while we're uh, getting this uh, shut down and the next program up, um, let me introduce our next, you want to come down? Um, let me introduce our next speaker. We've come to the point of making the uh, finding that we've got to change the way we do things. And uh, our next speaker is uh, an individual that's been doing that. Uh, he is a uh, graduate of civil engineering. Um, he has worked for consulting firms at a number of locations in the United States, uh, in, in Virginia, uh, and most recently in Florida. And he's traveled all over the United States. And when I thought, who could be on this program that could really talk to you about the way we need to change, it was pretty obvious that we needed a national expert. And that's who this gentleman is. In fact, it's, you could say he wrote the book. And he did. He wrote the book uh, published by the Urban Land Institute on residential streets. And where most transportation engineers think in terms that the object is to make the cars or the vehicles go from point A to point B fastest. This individual has been talking to people in the planning community for a decade or more uh, about how to do things differently to create holistic transportation systems. At this point, it's my real pleasure to introduce to you Walter Kulosh, uh, who is with us tonight from Florida. So, Walter.
assigned me a reassuringly young audiovisual guy. His name was John. And introductions or something went on too long, and the computer went into a hibernation mode. And my, my usual method of just hitting the escape just made things worse. So I said, John, we're going to need some help. Well, Mayor John Norquist jumps up and comes up to the computer <laughs> and starts pulling on the wires and all. And the real job came from the bit back and fixed it quickly. On the way out to the airport, I was mentioning to the mayor's assistant, she was driving me out, I said, I'm impressed that the mayor knows about computers. And she said, the mayor doesn't know anything about computers, <laughs> but he knows everything about when to look helpful. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor's moved on to be uh, uh, executive director of the Congress for the New Urbanism and has made it his business uh, to be uh, deeply involved with major transportation issues uh, throughout the country. So it's uh, a, a very uh, tremendous ally to have. The uh, preceding speakers, Ron and the Secretary, uh, leave very little doubt that, that we will have to change the way we do business uh, for transportation, either uh, because of dire financial reasons or even reasons of public opinion. Uh, this, uh, this transportation analyst, this is Tom Toll, uh, formerly from the Buffalo Evening News and now in Washington Post, uh, giving this vision of, gives this vision of the, of the U.S., uh, the 1,247 lane freeway, we're up in uh, decayed old cities of Florida, we're from theme park. Is this, is this really the vision, uh, is, is, this the, is this the cartoonist? And cartoonists have a very, uh, a very good finger on the pulse. Is this the cartoonist saying, great job, transportation planners, keep up the good work? Of course not. It's the cartoonist saying, you know, isn't something out of control? Uh, aren't we, in fact, as Ron said, going to have to rethink the way we do business? Uh, He's accurately putting his finger on the fact that we have created, with transportation, we've created quite possibly the most monstrous unintended consequence of any undertaking that we have done in the United States. Uh, and like all unintended consequences, it, it is the result of thousands or millions of reasonable decisions made for perfectly good reasons by rational by the rational man or the rational person that in aggregate are giving us a a monstrously dysfunctional and now unaffordable situation our model for transportation planning is admirably simple uh, this is the business as usual model uh, anticipate what's going to happen makes a great deal of sense uh, anticipate the land use forecast the traffic from that. So we've made great strides with this ability to forecast traffic and we hear things like the year 2030 or year 2040 projection and uh, until recently we used to take this as gospel and then accommodate, uh, build enough capacity to accommodate the projected growth. So this admirably simple model, uh, put, put in a little more graphical form here, says that the traffic always grows so Sooner or later, the capacity falls short, we increase it, and uh, theoretically, are supposed to take care of our 20-year needs. So these major projects that the Secretary talked about earlier, had they been built, we would have all thought at the time they'd take care of the 20-year needs. Uh, how many times have we seen this happen, even if the project is built? Uh, never, because what happens, we go ahead with the construction, but then what happens is traffic grows more than we thought. Now, is this because the traffic engineers and the regional planning people and Ron's agency can't make a good traffic forecast? And the answer is no. The answer is induced traffic, something that we didn't even have a word for a few years ago that we now fully understand that the courts now are finding environmental documentation deficient if it doesn't deal with it. Induced traffic is traffic that we, under the original premise, would not have been there, but is generated because of the traffic capacity that we added itself. It, traffic and transportation is unique among publicly provided services this way. Uh, other things don't have this induced feature. For example, our uh, wastewater treatment, formerly known as sewer system. If we double the capacity of that, 
do we start going to the bathroom twice as much? No, that is a fixed demand that we can accurately predict. If we add more schools, do we uh, add more school capacity? Do we start sending our kids uh, to primary education 14, 16, 18 years? No, we, we have all agreed that there's a 12 year cap on that. So traffic is the only uh, service or the, the only undertaking that has this induced traffic feature. So we go through the same series again, editorialists rant and rave about we must fix this problem and we come back to the same thing. So I think we can see what's going on. It's becoming clear that, and that reducing congestion is not our choice. Uh, we, we are going to have congestion almost under any circumstance of supply, particularly the remaining affordable options that we have. So the choice is not, are we going to have congestion or not? But the, the, the choice is under what terms are we going to have congestion? Are we going to have, are we going to have a congested environment, uh, but a beautiful uh, downtown area that's receiving a great deal of attention, uh, such as downtown Lancaster? Or are we going to have congestion in a suburban sprawl atmosphere? That's, that's the choice that we have. Now, what, what puts an end to this cycle? Uh, clearly all things, we can't keep cycling through adding more capacity, finding out it doesn't work, adding more. Sometimes just physical, the physical constraint itself, in this picture here, the, the wetlands and the property, the, ex the expense of the property simply says, we can't widen that road anymore. Uh, the realization uh, that, uh, that we're not curing obesity by loosening our belt Is, um, is dawning on us, and we're, we're beginning to act accordingly. Just another way of presenting the glum financial picture that the Secretary presented. Uh, what's happened, here's, here's revenue, very flat, uh, possibly even going down, and you can see that our rebuilding costs and our maintenance costs, the, the maintenance chicken coming home to roost from the giant mileage that we built in the last uh, few decades, uh, is gobbling up all the available funds, leaving almost nothing left uh, that we can discretionary in a discretionary fashion use for new capacity. So the pinch is on. Now, it's becoming clear that we are having, we are coming close to the point of peak oil. No matter what we might have thought about this before, kind of like global climate change, it's becoming more and more clear that yes, indeed, uh, we are uh, going to crest over peak oil. And that's causing us a, to change our notion. Uh, state DOTs are well aware of this. Our own DOT in Florida uh, uh, administration ago came to the conclusion uh, in a remarkable letter that uh, the problem of, of the, in, our, in today's problems, the policies of the 60s uh, won't get it anymore. And the then director of transportation went on with a very innovative program of Reduce, reducing or limiting road size, a, a policy that got reversed by a succeeding administration but is likely uh, to again uh, be reinstated. Uh, the public puts a stop to this more often than we might think. Uh, a referendum, again in my home city of Orlando, a, a referendum that every sort of good government, chamber of commerce, good roads group was behind for a locally funded sales tax that the public themselves in polls ahead of time said they were going to vote for overwhelmingly. Instead, when they got in the privacy of the, of the, of the voting booth, uh, voted it down resoundingly. So the public is saying that we don't think or we don't think we are willing to try to buy our way out of this. Uh, and then thoughtful direction about getting off this merry-go-round comes from things like this a remarkable back to prosperity document that the Brookings Institution did for the state of Pennsylvania uh, and pointed out the, uh, the, uh, the striking conclusion that uh, isn't it time that we stop paying people to leave Pennsylvania's brick built cities, that's their term, I like it, brick built cities, paying them with our transportation policy to leave those cities uh, and locate somewhere else. A very interesting observation that we wouldn't have seen a few years ago. Here's, what's, here's our transportation planning view of what's happening. The, 
the conventional transportation planning uh, diagram, or family tree, if you will, had one, until recently, had one big branch, and that branch was move cars. This was an enormously popular undertaking. The mandate was huge. Uh, everybody agreed. That's what we, that's, that's the answer to the problem. Cars aren't moving. Traffic engineer, get out there and move cars. What could be more simple? For the longest while, we were able to do that with more pavement, interstate program, a uh, big four laning of arterial. Uh, as that option uh, started to dry up due to funding, we had some further options about squeezing more out of the roads we have, more efficiency, better traffic signal systems. But it was still a, basically a single branch. We now realize that the family tree of transportation actions is not that one branch, but this whole tree of branches uh, that address the problem from different directions. So uh, the, the branch of moving people not cars. What if we define the problem as moving people, not cars? Isn't that why we were trying to move the cars in the first place? There's people in them. So walking, transit, and so forth. Uh, improving the quality of travel, a branch that we're in the infancy of understanding, the idea that there are other qualities to travel other than simply how fast or how far uh, you are accommodated, and that, in fact, these other qualities may be vastly more important to the motoring public than the measures we're using. Uh, how about the, uh, the branch of moving less people, fewer miles? A possibly bad grammar, but a very sound concept, uh, which, which is the conservation approach. Uh, this is something that the power industry, for example, the electric power industry, uh, has been doing now since the 1970s. Uh, they, the, Prior to the energy crisis in the 70s, power companies had a, a point of view similar to transportation engineers, which is we don't care where that demand is coming from, uh, whether that demand could be reduced, whether it's frivolous, whether it's wasteful demand. Our job is to serve that demand uh, at every household with the power they need. And then after the energy crisis of the 70s, uh, became very interested in conservation and started making huge inroads into their capacity problem, not by adding more capacity, but by shaving off demand. So in the infancy of understanding that, uh, some things like uh, tele telecommuting uh, have had an up and down history. At first we thought telecommuting is going to be wonderful, uh, people won't have to go to work during peak hour, won't have to, won't have to go to work in a central place anymore. Uh, then it turned out to be kind of a disappointment that uh, no matter how good the telecommuting climate was, people still came into offices. But then we started realizing that, but they're freed from peak hour travel. So now we're back to thinking uh, tremendous benefit uh, of people being able, because they have PC and cell phones and other kinds of communication at home, to not be hostage to coming in between 8 and 9 and leaving between 3 and 5. Then in-town living, something that caught us all by surprise, the idea that people would want to live uh, in the center city or in loft apartments uh, all over the country, uh, as, and that has an enormous impact on uh, transportation. Uh, we made a computation once for Cleveland uh, around the university circle area that just 600 in-town households living around the, uh, living around the uh, university area is equivalent travel reduction to a pair of lanes for a mile on an arterial street. So millions and millions of dollars of public expenditure evaded because privately people chose to live in areas they now regard as, as desirable and resurgent. What are some of the principles then of translating all those branches of the family tree into design and actions, uh, the kind of actions that uh, advocacy groups like Our Glass can get behind or that that acting officials can get behind. Uh, network, street network is enormously important. Uh, the conventional suburban way of laying out new growth uh, has the land use is separated and a street system that connects only to the major highways, typically a state highway. This was considered a good way to lay things out until recently. The antithesis of that, which is the traditional network, uh, something that we're sitting in the middle of here in Lancaster, uh, has the same land uses. That's not the issue. People still have a place to live and place to shop. 
but the land uses have adjacency and that there's a high degree of connectivity with the street system. Now, why is this so important from a transportation point of view? Uh, this is the travel pattern as seen by a computer uh, doing a traffic model. So you can see with, without network, all the trips are hostage to, a, to the existing highway system, typically state, uh, typically a PennDOT highway. Uh, all the travel is bundled onto that. The, uh, we reach a level of congestion at a very low level of development, and we set up an almost insurmountable tendency for that street to become a magnet for strip commercial development. Almost no power on earth, regulatory or anything else, will stop that from happening. <laughs> the antithesis is uh, with a network of streets, uh, trips, many trips, uh, in fact, about three quarters of trips, have the option of making the trip without being hostage to the state highway. So, for example, the shopping trip gets to the shopping area using local streets. The school trip, this is the blue line, uh, can be made through the community on local streets, even raises a possibility that trip can be made uh, by means other than a parent driving the, the student and so forth. So I, I think we can see that we've created a radically different uh, kind of uh, travel pattern. This has enormous consequences for the performance of the highway system. The, technically, uh, the answer is quite simple, that the, that the same number of lanes as this example, a four-lane road by a six-lane road, uh, those same number of lanes have more capacity when they're spread out, when they're, when they're uh, disaggregated into a system, in this case, of, of two two-lane streets by three two-lane streets, more capacity than the, than the same number of lanes in a bigger street. How can this be true? Isn't there economy of scale in bigger things? The answer is no, not with traffic. Uh, there's diseconomy of scale with roads. And the reason has to do with simply there's far more locations to make turning movements. Uh, the uh, traffic signalization can be much simpler. The lost time at traffic signals due to phases and size of intersection goes down. So uh, there's no question this is, this is irrefutable and that uh, we, we are better off from a traffic capacity point of view with network of smaller streets. That's, that's why people so often are baffled and mystified by these two and three hundred year old systems of streets like Lancaster or Center City, Philadelphia, that seem to be functioning marvelously well and that are absorbing things like 30 story office buildings in Philadelphia or new convention centers and function just fine. And the, there's a sort of a predisposition to think that how can this be, this, something must be screwy here, something must be wrong. These are old, old streets. The idea is very old. But the answer is the capacity is very high. Uh, this was uh, that last uh, piece. Uh, can I back up here? Is that permitted? Uh, did you did you establish that? Sir? Oh, good. Okay. Good. The uh, this was research done and published in our own trade journal, ITE Journal, that shows uh, as you build up through the different street systems different size streets. That's a little diagram at the top. So we go from two lanes to two lanes with a turning lane to four lanes and on up. The, the capacity of the additional lane uh, goes down. The incremental capacity goes down. So it's true, four lanes carries more than two lanes. We don't dispute that. But the increment of capacity per square yard of asphalt laid starts to go down uh, uh, very sharply just for the reasons we talked about. So again, f uh, further further support that there is no economy of scale in streets. The, the shape of the network doesn't matter. Uh, it's the connectivity that matters. So you can have very formal grids like Center City or the Washington, D.C. or the, the European uh, or even, uh, uh, at, even as an extreme, say, the, the Pittsburgh type of configuration around the hills, as long as it's connected. That's, uh, that's, that's the important thing. Uh, the, uh, a lot of jurisdictions now are writing these kind of connectivity options into their local land development regulations uh, to get at least some degree of perimeter uh, connectivity. Uh, the, uh, the answer to, uh, the, uh, to 
uh, the thought that are we talking about something old and old-fashioned here with the network of streets? And the answer is about as old-fashioned as your cell phone system. Uh, the diagram on the left is the old uh, 15450 uh, radio band, miserable systems. Uh, DOT might have had that a few years ago, and con contractors have it. All the traffic goes through a tower. Uh, it, the tower, the traffic jams. Uh, the reception is bad. There's only one point of uh, there's only one uh, point of, of all the switching. The cell phone system, the diagram on the right, is the antithesis of that. Many small nodes, low capacity links, but as a system, uh, uh, gives a tremendous capacity. So uh, nothing, uh, uh, nothing uh, new or old about it. The uh, network is critical if we're going to evade the normal strip development pattern that is happening in all suburbs. Not, not just those surrounding Lancaster, but throughout the entire state, throughout the country. Uh, uh, this is part of the people's distress with what's happening with traffic is the typical suburban arterial blight. Uh, if, we, if we lay things out without network, it's, uh, it's completely possible to have all the right things there. So in the diagram, uh, places to buy things, place to work, uh, school. But nothing is within a walking distance, uh, so we we have not created the walkable, attractive environment that people want to live in. Arranging the same things on a network of streets, this just happens to look a lot like something that you might see uh, uh, along Queen Street in downtown Lancaster, uh, keeping the same land uses, keeping even more pavement. This, this diagram actually has more pavement than the suburban model before, but practically everything is within the walking distance. So. This is not only a huge factor in the quality of life for the development right now, but this kind of, of concentration of activity within a 500-foot radius, the right-hand diagram, is the critical step for transit. This is the hard thing about transit. Uh, once you get that kind of pattern, hooking it together with one or the other of the transit modes is the easy part. The hard part is getting it uh, arranged that way in the first place. Another principle uh, that we are observing about transportation planning now is to pay closest attention to the context of what we're doing, uh, the context ranging from the left-hand part of the diagram from the rural through the suburban, uh, through the small town to the, to the city, and understanding that practically everything about our street design varies as you move through, uh, as you move through this spectrum. Uh, the cross-section elements, the things that define what the street looks like. The frontage, well, what we do with the frontage of the street. Now, is this, a, is this a PennDOT prerogative? Absolutely not. It's a borough, city, local prerogative, but it's got everything to do with, with how that street performs. And this is one of the great land use transportation connections that we're now starting to appreciate, is that the partnership of what the local jurisdiction does with how the activity is sited along the road in combination with the DOT's road action makes all the difference in the world. So how we site the buildings and do the parking. And then the network elements, uh, the, uh, the frequency and type of, of access that we're going to have to the arterial streets make all the difference to the performance of the street. Network, again, we keep coming back to network. Uh, building siting, uh, is an, uh, not, how buildings sit on the street uh, makes an enormous difference. So, you know, think just, we have examples close at hand, this marvelous new development just across uh, the street from the campus here uh, that kind of looks like loft buildings recycled. Uh, think of, th those are beautiful and make the street because of how they're sited. The same buildings set back with a double row of parking in front would just be another piece of suburban blight. Uh, along the Harrisburg Pike. So uh, the way they are sited makes all the difference of work. So we're starting to understand that, uh, that given the typical situation that we have uh, in our growing areas, in, in, our, in our growth areas in the county, uh, even, if, even if the DOT or whatever road jurisdiction gives us everything we want, streetscape, uh, beautiful sidewalks and everything, we still haven't gotten anywhere with a real livable environment until we start intervening in how the next wave of growth is sited along those streets. This is one of the most doable things that can be done. This is a, a completely local prerogative. 
uh, sometimes it doesn't even, uh, it, the local governments are completely enabled to do this. Uh, it, it makes no difference in the ability of the owner to use their property. They can still have the same square footage, the same use, the, the same amount of parking, although it turns out you don't need that much once this pattern gets successful. And then uh, another principle has to do with overcoming uh, what we sometimes call the wrong sizing of, of roads. Uh, a lot of the Secretary's comments about the big blockbuster projects that were being nursed along through little bits of spending here and there are indicative of a wrong sized pro project that we're never really going to get to that project under today's funding realities, but we keep, uh, we keep pretending like we are. Part of that problem of wrong sizing is that a minimum standard got set, uh, typically a traffic level of service in a future year. So this standard got set saying that we're going to project traffic out to the year 2040 and we're going to have to carry all of that at a good level of service. Things like, you probably heard these terms, level of service C or level of service D. Uh, and that says, that gives us then a threshold that we can't go below. So it's, you know, do or die. We've got to build the four lane bypass or nothing. Uh, the concept of right sizing says, wait, no, there's not just that threshold in the single project that met that, but there's likely to be a whole series of, of other possibilities, some of which provide most of the benefit at a fraction of the cost. And I think we're all familiar with this concept from, from households. Uh, like uh, my wife has, my wife typically likes the blue ball here. They, you know, we're, let's do it right and, 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 and not have to redo it ever again in the future. And I take the viewpoint, well, you know, can't we, can't we get three quarters of the benefit by spending only one quarter? So well, I think we're all familiar with this uh, kind of thing. It makes perfectly good sense. It, made, it, it would have made good sense 30 years ago, but we had the money to indulge in always achieving the blue spot before. Uh, that reality, that, that is gone now. That ability to do that is gone. At first we thought it was gone, but it's going to come back. Things like the Secretary's comments make it clear that it's gone and it's not going to come back. And so we, we need to start thinking about some of these red spots, right-sizing the project. And then a couple of traffic engineering truths that affect the way we think about traffic. Uh, the famous speed-flow relationship. This is a, uh, this is a plot of, of uh, capacity across the horizontal axis and the speed. At what speed do we move, speed of traffic, at what speed do we move the most traffic? 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour? No, out at the nose of the curve, this point where the little red arrow is, uh, at about 25 to 30 miles an hour is where we move the most traffic. Uh, and this informs us then that road designs that don't achieve the high speed may not be costing us any capacity at all. Uh, provided they give us reasonable speed, such as 45 miles an hour instead of 60. Now, is that saying you should go from one end of the state to the other at 45 miles an hour? No. But it is saying that where we are trying to preserve, uh, where we're trying to do a number of other things with our community, uh, then pay attention to the fact that a small decrease in speed may yield huge, uh, huge dividends in other qualities. And then the same kind of thing, uh, same sort of principle applies with with our road design criteria. These are plots, these are plots of design criteria from the Bible of road design and with which we agree. Uh, the, the red line, for example, the stopping site distance, the distance that you have to be able to see down the road with certain criteria has everything to do with safe operation of the road. And uh, what you can see, the way that that, that red line sh slopes up sharply is it increases exponentially. So 40 miles an hour is only twice as fast as 20 miles an hour, but the stopping site distance is four times as big, and therefore the damage we do to the environment, the cost of the improvement, the amount of trees we cut, the amount of properties we have to take to flatten out the curves, all goes up geometrically. So again, part of this right sizing that brings the cost of the projects down uh, may also have big environmental and quality of life consequences. Now, where are, where, where are some of these principles being put into practice? Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, principles. Uh, this is New Jersey. This is uh, in one of the Pinelands uh, Reserve, one of these growth communities within the Pinelands, Pinelands Preserve where, where they are allowing growth. Uh, the, the 
armature on which they're going to allow the growth is the dotted uh, purple lines. Network, network, network. They are not contemplating widening the state highways in these communities. They're going to accommodate the growth through additional network. The uh, Lexington, Kentucky area uh, uh, illustrating plans for building that kind of network in advance of the growth, uh, making it a public making it a public enterprise to map these things and then elicit the, uh, the ability to build it out of all sorts of different sources. The, the development community as it develops, little pieces of publicly funded ones, use of existing roads cobbled together. Uh, the Route 29 uh, in uh, downtown Trenton, uh, all of the options there for undoing that riverfront freeway uh, all of them had to do with adding much more network back into the city so that the city, the residential areas of the city, can reclaim their riverfront. Uh, this from Flemington, uh, New Jersey, is uh, almost a textbook case of land use and transportation working together. Uh, two, major, uh, two major routes coming together, 202 and the existing Route 31, and uh, as originally conceived, a freeway bypass, a sort of four-lane freeway tearing through the countryside, uh, same thing that this, this got to the same fate that the projects that the Secretary was talking about revisiting in Pennsylvania did, the realization that, you know, we're not really going to build this thing, are we, guys? Uh, we also don't like what it's doing to our community. Uh, what are the options? Uh, all, these might as well be from Pennsylvania, the, the, the whole factor of the beautiful landscape that is going through, the history, uh, the, the, the natural environment, uh, the quality of life uh, on the uh, uh, existing uh, small network of roads. Uh, the, the area was unrealistically zoned in the, into industrial, uh, uh, which was giving rise to, since and that, that amount of industry, of course, is a fiction, the, the possibility. So it was giving rise to this kind of hodgepodge of land use, uh, none of which was connected, uh, and therefore all was dumping onto the existing state highway system, leading in turn to the demand that we have uh, some sort of freeway through. Uh, the, the planning process, and process is enormously important. Uh, the planning process involved these kinds of scenes. Uh, these, these are DOT people, uh, designers, consultants, and the public uh, in these sort of hands-on working session. Uh, this kind of process is disorderly. Uh, it's stressful to us engineers. We're not used to doing things like that. Uh, it's, uh, it's unpredictable, uh, and it works. It just works beautifully. <laughs> uh, so the answer. Uh, surprise, surprise, network. So you see the green, the blue, different gradations of work. The green is no longer the four-lane freeway through there. It is a parkway uh, with environmental preserves uh, purchased alongside of part of it, part of as part of the project. And then the blue and the red are supporting uh, are supporting pieces. Uh, the network within some of those development sites, like the pink uh, area, is all provided by a private development project. They were prepared to build that much road anyhow, uh, it, rather than it being a road that simply drained out onto State Highway 31, it becomes now a valued, valued part of the network. Uh, some key features, the things, uh, eyesores, uh, like the, uh, the, the huge uh, rotary, uh, is serving the same traffic function, but in the plan morphing into something that has the capability of being a town square uh, in town center. Now, uh, who said it was the business of a, of a highway project to get involved in something like this? Uh, but that's the essence of high, uh, that's the essence, we think, of the transportation land use connection. It's not trying to intervene in the land use. Most people think the, the essence of land use transportation is get out there and intervene in the land use. Don't let that happen. Uh, don't let that big box locate out there. Uh, uh, don't let those people flee to the suburbs. No. Uh, we, th we think the essence is to understand that uh, the land use activity that's going to happen is probably going to happen anyhow. Uh, and the challenge is to deal with it uh, as it happens uh, in ways uh, uh, like this project uh, did uh, in Flemington. Interestingly, what happened to the volumes? Uh, 
the, uh, these are scaled, uh, these diagrams are scaled, and the right-hand diagram is the, is the projected volume with the network plan in place, and that is saying that it offers the same, it, it actually offers more relief to Route 31. The Route 31 red line is narrower under the network plan. So it actually offers more relief to 31 than the original freeway plan did. This doesn't surprise us anymore. This kind of thing you know, used to be big news a few years ago. We see it too often now and realize uh, it's, it's no big surprise. Uh, just to prove this same thing applies in different climates in different parts of the country, the absolutely horrendous uh, State Route 50 corridor in Orlando, uh, do not go visit that if you're down there. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, truly bad, just the projects that are in play, the development projects that are in play, are going to, with, with a little urging, are going to provide this piece of network, this, 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 this is, or this was pre, this was pre uh, Helsing meltdown. Uh, these are coming on a little slower than we thought. <laughs> uh, but that's, this, this will happen though, these things, these things come in waves. Uh, the existing signalization, uh, Actually, more traffic signals will be added. And then we end up with this kind of tremendous network. So I think you can see that for their local daily needs, all these new residents, and, and all the daily needs are along the black State Route 50, the residents are going to be able to get to their daily needs without ever going on State Route 50 or going on it very little. So we've improved State Route 50 enormously, not by widening State Route 50 from its already awful six lanes, but by doing a whole series of other things. Uh, have, we, have we relieved State Route 50? Absolutely. Uh, it is now more free for use by the people who really should be on it, the longer distance commuter, people going to the hospital, and so forth. Uh, citing, uh, this principle of citing things is, is everything. Uh, it's, it, it lets us then, instead of getting this, get this kind of, this kind of, of traffic generator world of difference on how you handle traffic. Uh, instead of this, this, uh, or this. Uh, instead of this, uh, this is storage, uh, this. This is a store, this is a, a sure guard self storage inside of there in a, with, with form controls uh, making this kind of thing happen. So you can see that with nothing more than the locally applied control of the form of the the form of what's built, not the use. This is still a, this is still a short-term storage place, but the form has made all the difference in our ability to have a real piece of town there and have town traffic, all the things that come with town traffic and <coughs> pedestrian environment instead of suburban strip traffic. We, our diagram that we showed before, our admirably simple model said that, you know, we anticipate and we end up accommodating we're really starting to wonder if the reverse isn't what really uh, isn't the way to go with our land use transportation, to adopt the road design first, like we did, like we saw what happened in Flemington, New Jersey, in that example, and that in turn will manage the travel. The travel will accommodate uh, because of the road design that's there, and that that will influence the land use uh, so that we, uh, we tackle land use, not by trying to grab hold of the land use and say, you can't do that, uh, can't have that density, can't build the convention center downtown because where are they going to park, whatever. We, we instead start with what do we want this place to be uh, and work it from that direction. And then finally, a few words about the eternal question that always comes up, this, this the sort of sputtering, stammering, but, 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 but where will the traffic go? We hear this all the time. You know, we love the pictures, we, we like the little network, uh, we, we love the idea of a convention center downtown, but tell me where is the traffic going to go? Uh, one answer is uh, it's, there's, there's simply going to be less of it be, because of economics 101. It'll find a new price point. So our policy right now, uh, the, the red circle here, is we're trying to provide traffic at no cost. The, the cost of traffic to the user is congestion, at least until the state gets busy with more tolls. But right now, the cost is the congestion. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to provide congestion-free travel free travel, in other words. So what happens with the free good? You consume it irresponsibly, uh, or consume a lot of it at least. What happens when the price goes up? You consume less. And so we'll simply reach new price points. That's, that's what will happen. Uh, how drastic is that? Uh, 
uh, people travel at a different time. Uh, how terrible is that? Uh, it's our company's most cherished fringe benefit, uh, the flex time we started after people started getting PCs and all. So the idea that you can come in any time now between 7 and 10 in the morning uh, and have a similar window after most popular fringe benefit we've got. So how, how dire is something that's your firm's most popular fringe benefit? Uh, we've learned that traffic just doesn't dump. If, if, we, if we tame one road or we downsize it or we right-size it, that the traffic we thought we were going to get on there just doesn't dump on this hapless next-door neighbor, but it spreads out in a gentle cascade throughout the entire network. Our, our models show us that in actual practice. Uh, so it's, the, the network has this tremendous ability to flex. Uh, uh, we like this quote from Sherlock Holmes, great transportation planner. I said, whenever you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be the truth. So uh, like Charlotte, uh, uh, just before Christmas, started running their light rail uh, trains. Uh, uh, highly improbable 10 years ago this would have been thought of. But it, it was becoming clear in Char Charlotte that moving these, moving these people in vehicles was going to be impossible. So uh, 24 new start light rail cities. People reinvest in their homes. Uh, anybody got a problem with that in, instead of moving out to new track housing? I don't think so. Uh, retailing adopts to smaller size. This is an interesting, interesting thing that we're in the infancy of seeing. Uh, we, uh, in, in my uh, hometown community in Florida, uh, our very aggressive Floridian grocery chain is sprouting all these 2,800 square foot grocery stores. That's sort of a half size store, feels like, a, uh, feels like an old fashioned neighborhood store. Uh, why are they doing it? Uh, we really know because they're our client on a lot of places. They're doing it because of traffic congestion. That, they can no longer meet the demographic they need for their 60,000 square foot store, which is 10,000 households, 10,000 population, 4,000 households within an eight minute drive. When they can't meet that, uh, are they abandoning the market to Elbersons? No, they are coming in with a different product that adapts to the transportation reality. Uh, we're beginning to think that some of what we now think are the worst culprits, the monster big box that, that seem to be leading the charge to suburban sprawl, may actually be the quickest to, uh, to realize how to adapt to congestion, but they have to have the congestion in the first place. They'll never do it as long as we hold out the promise of unlimited uh, congestion-free travel. Uh, smaller size institutions such as schools, uh, congestion acts toward that. Do we have a problem with that? Uh, this was a concern, though, about congestion. Carl Rasmussen, state MnDOT traffic engineer, uh, in Minnesota, warning us uh, about the dire consequences of what would happen uh, if we succeeded in our plans for narrowing the Olson Highway out of downtown Minneapolis from six lanes to four lanes. Carl's saying people get sick and tired of congestion and, and, so lay it on us, Carl, what will they do? And move into the city. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, would that be okay with Lancaster? You know, people got sick and tired of congestion out in the county and moved into Lancaster. Uh, probably okay. Uh, this isn't Paris, this is uh, Orlando where, uh, where the people are doing exactly that. So we're starting to appreciate that the chain of impacts uh, probably runs different than what we thought. The chain of impacts, the conventional chain of impacts uh, that uh, says, you know, when you widen a road, good things happen. We do, you reduce the delay in cost. But we're now understanding the unintended consequences kick in and we morph into all these negative things. Like reducing the delay means people simply go further for things and then we start sprouting bizarre ways of retailing in response. And so what looked like good things have a way of morphing into bad things. Being engineers, we, we believe in converses, things running the other way too, positive, negatives. So what if we did the unthinkable of accepting congestion, uh, not a politically attractive thing, I realize. Uh, but say it's coming, so we've got to ex exist. And at first it looks like bad things happen. Delay increases, the cost increases. But then, uh, you know, people start improving their home, for example, like we saw in the diagram. Bad thing, good thing, starting to become a good thing. The businesses that were depending on those people living there stay in business. Uh, definitely a good thing now. So uh, we're, we're starting to realize we may have had the paradigm all wrong. Uh, we now have the opportunity, since we've run out of money to pursue the old paradigm, we sort of have this golden opportunity to let's try pursuing something different.
we have the great good fortune here uh, in, in Lancaster of having this really big piece of, of historically correct paradigm uh, showing the way and being carefully cared for and renovated uh, uh, over the past few decades. And we'd like to get back uh, to uh, <laughs> where people name churches after, after traffic. <laughs> I thought I was falling asleep at the wheel. This, this is a real, the, no, no, there's been no doctored photographs. This was US 29 near Salisbury, North Carolina. I almost ran off the road thinking. <laughs> and uh, and uh, went back, and sure enough, the cornerstone, you could almost guess the date. The cornerstone was the 50s, I think 53 or something like that. So we would like to get back to that, where, where people think so much of what we've done with transportation and land use that they will again uh, name churches after our product. I uh, certainly do appreciate this opportunity for, uh, for taking you through uh, this sort of gallop through traffic engineering here and would welcome any chance to uh, have some further discussion and questions. Thank you. Well, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming tonight, especially our two speakers. And... Uh, Another uh, thank you for the uh, for our sponsors tonight. But I, I have a couple, couple of observations. One is uh, having gone to China a lot and and listening to this program tonight. I go to Tianjin, and about every two years, they would install another ten lane ring road, <laughs> and each one about five miles outside the other, and they continue to build them. Uh, and the second the, the the second thing I was looking about bridges. I was over in England this year. And, uh, and Darby, and, and there's a bridge over the Severn River that's made out of uh, cast iron that was built in 1794, and looks like the day they put it up. The, uh, so there are other alternatives to you know, the bridges. The uh, other comment I made about citing manufacturing, uh, what we've done is we've moved manufacturing out in the countryside, and being in the foundry business, we have our foundry in downtown Wrightsville, you could not put that plant there today, although we're a good neighbor and everything else. Matter of fact, the city of Lancaster has two foundries operating, and probably most people don't even know where they are that they even exist. So there's a lot of preconceptions about this idea that you have to move manufacturing out and people have to drive and get back forth because Lancaster was built in Hamilton Watch and Armstrong Cork Company being within the city and people living and working in the same place. But I... Uh, had my uh, mind open tonight because I'm thinking Route 23, you know, and that bill was somewhere around 300 and some million dollars, which might be better spent maybe after listening tonight. So I wanted to I wanted to just end with this thought about the Hourglass Foundation. I was thinking tonight our mission was to is to uh, create the conditions for intelligent decision making and work for innovative solutions that balance the need for growth and economic prosperity with the preservation of what makes it special. And our strategy, and one of them, is to provide insights into innovative solutions before decisions are made. And I think tonight we've heard a way of, of thinking about traffic and about how to handle it and how to develop that is perhaps counterintuitive. And it's our hope that we will start to get this message out into the people who are responsible for making these decisions. So. With that, I'll end it tonight, and thanks for coming, and thank you, gentlemen, which is another round of applause, and thank you very much.